My name's Danielle Clark. I'm a brand strategist and I'm about to be on the online prosperity show. You are about to hear how I got started in branding, um, my journey so far, um, the amazing clients I've been working with and how you can start to bring branding and creativity into your business. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Online Prosperity Show, where we dive deep into the minds of visionary entrepreneurs, unlocking the secrets to their success and sharing wisdom to propel you toward your own prosperity. I'm your host, Prosper Tarovinga. Today, we've got a guest who's not just shaping brands, but also reshaping the way we perceive, engage, and interact with the world around us. Now, Danielle, how are you doing? I am fantastic. Thank you, Prosper. Lovely, yeah. It's a lovely morning. I'm feeling good. Oh, I'm really excited. We caught you before you really got famous because you're doing incredible <laughs> things next week, aren't you? Yes, I am. I'm doing something super exciting. Um, I am co-hosting at a festival in Birmingham and it's called the Birmingham Design Festival and it's across three days with loads of fantastic guests and speakers from the design and illustration and and product design world so um yeah I'm going to be helping bring bring that to Birmingham and helping to make that happen so super excited about that absolutely so if you're watching this be rest assured that you're in good hands you are in literal brand design royalty space. All right. So take a knee because I think Danielle is going to be showcasing to us why she is the one person that can help your brand push through the noise and build a better and stronger brand. And from what I've seen, she has a knack for bridging the gap between business and imagination. Now, Danielle, I could go on and on and talk about your accolades and things of that nature. Why don't you take me out of my misery? Tell us a little bit about your journey and how you actually got started in the world of branding and design. Yeah, so that's a really, really good question. And I I like to take people quite far back <laughs> because it started um a little bit earlier than most people expect. Um I of course went to I went to university and college, but there was a time before that where brand and design really started to come into my life. And um I remember a time when I was I was at school and I got sent a letter home from school wasn't that kind of letter. I wasn't in any trouble or anything like that. Um, but the letter was the school asking for uh, donations, basically. The school were fundraising for uh, all sorts of things. And they'd often send letters home for the parents to, to contribute, basically, to that. Now, I used to hate taking these letters home. I didn't want to take the letter home to my mum. We didn't have a lot. And... I didn't want to burden her with with yet another request. So on this particular occasion, I kept the letter in my reading bag and thought to myself, right, there's there's got to be a better way that I can um, get this money. Now, creativity was a huge part of my life growing up, whether it was me putting Lego figures together or playing with Play-Doh or doing colouring in and things like that. I, I love being creative and so I decided to come up with an idea and the idea was to create a school magazine so I thought to myself right I'm gonna ask my friends to join in I'm gonna speak to the teachers and and ask them if we can do this at school and they said yes so I wrote to my friends I did the front page of this magazine we had a colouring in page in there, we had a jokes page in there, we had puzzles. Bearing in mind, I was around eight years old at the time. So we asked the teachers if we could make photocopies and they let us. We stapled the pages together. We went out into the playground at home time and sold them to the parents 
for 25p each. Now, I can still remember the feeling till this day, that buzz that I created, that excitement. It was all about bringing people together and getting people to collaborate and get excited about this thing, this magazine that we produced. It was so easy to get my friends on board. They were so excited to see some of their, uh, you know, pictures that they they drawn that that we're gonna be coloured in and puzzles and things. The teachers were so on board with us for coming up with this idea. It was so easy to sell all these magazines to the parents in the playground. And for me, that's that's where it all started because I had a problem and I used my creativity and my collaborative skills to solve that problem because we made money and, and it wasn't about the parents donating they they were they were getting something in return something that, that that we'd worked really really hard on and that we were really proud of so i think that's where it's where it's all st started really and 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 i just i just love creativity and I, I think it can really solve problems oh absolutely and congratulations i mean eight, an eight-year-old coming up with such a brand breaking idea i don't think i was even able to write my own name at eight let alone write a magazine so there you go that is something remarkable now is this something that you had seen before or did it just um you know occur to you that this had to be done because that was quite clever well growing up i i used to love reading comics so comic books was a thing that I was really, really into. And often on a Saturday, we'd go, me and my mum would go, we'd walk to uh, this really big supermarket and there'd be the, the magazine stand and I'd scan the shelves and I'd rummage in my pocket and wonder, if I, have, I, have I got my 50p to get this this comic? And the comic, the comic books of the time were the Beano and the Dandy. And I was a Beano kid. I loved the Beano. I loved Dennis the Menace. Um, so maybe my love of reading comics may have may have influenced the idea for for, for creating something physical, creating a, a magazine. But ultimately, I just didn't want to. I didn't want to just go and ask my mum for money again. I, I knew how how difficult things were and. I uh, I thought there's got to be a better way. And yeah, it just sort of came to me to start the magazine. Absolutely. What did mom do at that time? So mom was, I think mom was doing housekeeping at a, um, at a hotel. So yeah, I think she used to have to go in and, and clear the rooms and then make up the rooms ready for the next guest. Mm, I can only imagine because obviously with that and then you had the empathy at that age to know not to bother her because some some kids would have just not seen it that way. Yeah, I suppose it's this is probably the, the first time I've ever really sat and thought of it like that. But yeah, I, I have a, a huge amount of respect for my mum. She was a, a single parent and you know she absolutely did did her best and worked extremely hard and um yeah i i just i just didn't want to burden her with that request and i was always trying to come up with ways and ideas to to make money like i remember when i went and asked my neighbor if i could wash their car <laughs> 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 you know, I just went and knocked on the door. I had, I remember I had a bucket and a sponge and some fairy washing up liquid. Other washing up liquids are available. But, um, you know, at the time, fairy washing up liquid probably wasn't the best, <laughs> mm. the best thing to be using to wash a car. But I'd, I went and knocked on the door and my neighbour said yes. And, you know, I wasn't even tall enough to reach, reach the roof properly. So I remember wiping it and leaving this kind of half semicircle <laughs> where I couldn't quite reach I couldn't quite reach the middle properly so 
yeah, I was probably, I don't know, I was probably 10, around 10 at that time. So yeah, I, I was always looking, I was always thinking about ways that I could try and make, make a little bit of money. You know, I had a paper round as well. I remember, I remember when I was about, I think I was about 11 because I was just starting secondary, secondary school, just going into year seven. And again, I thought, right, what, what can I do to bring in a little bit of money to, to buy my, my own snacks and to put towards my bus fare and things like that. And I remember going out one Saturday and walking, I walked for miles and, and every corner shop that I saw, I went into and asked them if they had a, a paper round available. I walked for ages and ages and ages. And eventually I found one and it just so happened to be, I sort of did a loop and it was one of the closest news agents near me. My friend had um, a paper round at that time and she said, oh, someone's left and I think they're looking for someone else. And I went and spoke to a shopkeeper, Naina, and yeah, she gave me the gave me the paper round. So yeah, I've I've always been looking for for ways to <laughs> to make a little bit of money, even as a kid, you know. Absolutely. And now you've become a sought after brand strategist and that is nothing short of fascinating. Would you maybe attribute mom to be somewhat of a role model because her hard work and also giving you the space to create, like you said, half of the things that you're creating was through Lego and obviously Play-Doh and things of that nature, having that sort of support would have actually made the creative juices to start flowing because had you also just been given everything that you would have wanted, you would have just, you know, been, um, you know, yes, not as creative as that because everything is just given. Yeah, I think there's definitely, uh, I could definitely attribute to a lot of, um, sort of my passion for creativity and design to my mum, but also to the rest of rest of my family as well. Creativity runs in the family. Um, I went to, I went to see my nan yesterday and um, she made us a lovely Sunday dinner and my uncle came over. It was really nice and we were talking and she took out all these pictures of a fashion show that she did when she was in her, um, probably twenties. And she was showing me all these incredible designs that she, she never trained to be a, um, a fashion designer or a pattern maker or anything like that. She would just get, she'd get these ideas. She'd look at the fabric and she would just cut them and, and work it out and stitch them and sew them. And the, she was showing me the the pictures from this catwalk and I was just amazed. So creativity definitely runs in, in my family. You know, my uncle works in, in fashion also. Um, you know, there's, there's this real, um, theme of creativity and, and art. My mom was really good at art at school and, and loved really good at drawing and loved painting. And those are the things that, are, that were around me as, as a child, as I say, we didn't have a lot of money, but the things that were affordable were paper, watercolors. I used to love working in watercolor as a, as a kid, crayons, Play-Doh, Lego, um, all of those things were, were available to me. And, and I used to spend a, a lot of time playing and using them and, and, yeah, it was it was just a part of my childhood that I think has definitely lent itself to to where I am today. Mm, absolutely. And you've gone on to work with reputable clients like Skoda, you know, Girls versus Cancer. You've also worked with um yeah, a few notable brands that you know, G Tech, UK Biocenter, and also helpful mind clinic um that you've actually helped to stand out there what what's been the biggest highlight of um your career so far gosh the biggest highlight of my career so far um 
I think you as you know you mentioned some some big brand names there and and all of having an opportunity to work with any of these brands and and play play a role however big or small is always incredible and and super valuable but actually I think there's a brand in particular that I've worked with that doesn't happen to be on there they're a, a smaller organization but the one that I think has had the most impact on me and and on them so um during during the pandemic during covid a lot of us were very static weren't we we were sat down we were on zooms much yeah. like this and um in my spare time one of my hobbies is playing hockey i played i play field hockey now for those of you that don't know hockey it it takes quite a strain on the body on on the back on the knees etc uh and i twisted my knee quite badly some years ago and it's it was never having seen physios and things it was never fully right it never really got back to normal and during lockdown it started started to get worse really because i was just sat down so much not really going out anyway i um i was introduced to someone by my business coach at the time um we were having a chat and he was a well at the time i thought he was a pt let's let's just describe him as that so you know we were just having a chat catching up i was finding out more about his business and what he did and then i started telling him about my knee and he said okay um i'll tell you what get up and do a squat for me bear in mind this is on zoom <laughs> so i'm sat there like okay so i get up i do a squat i adjust my camera i do a squat facing forwards facing sideways facing backwards I turn around and he's got this whiteboard <clears throat> and he's got this list of all the things that he spotted that are wrong with me within within a matter of seconds. So we said, yeah, I can see what I can see what's wrong. You've got you've got such and such tilt and this, that and the other. He said, yeah, yeah I'll probably have you out of pain in, in about six weeks because I was suffering really badly with my knee pain. It was really starting to, to impact my life. And I thought, six weeks, who is this guy? <laughs> <laughs> I've been seeing physios, I've been seeing doctors, and he reckons he can get me out of pain in six weeks. But I thought, you know what, what have I got to lose? So I did it, I went through the program. And within about six weeks, I was pain free, and I couldn't believe it. And so I said to him, so what's because he'd been telling me about his business, and he was struggling, he was thinking about packing it in and, and going and working for, for another organisation as, as an in house PT. And so I wanted to help him. So he agreed to work with me and we did some brand strategy. We figured out his USP and who his ideal customer was and all of those sorts of things and how he should really position himself. And we rebranded him and his business has just skyrocketed. He, he was making around 400 pounds a month at the time we spoke and really struggling and you know he's turning over you know three to four k a month now he's got a facility he's took on staff he started going into business and doing movement work with people he's known as the body fix coach and he gets people out of pain and it's been transformational so that has is definitely out of all of the the projects that i've worked on today has been the one that I feel has been yeah the most transformational the most the most impactful absolutely because you literally gave this coach his life back I mean for somebody who has such tremendous skill and only to already want to pack it in just simply because they can't reach their audience and all they needed was to have a meeting with you I can only imagine had that been maybe face to face the transformation would have been a whole lot much more and 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 things of that nature and also you then went on and started your business during the pandemic that takes a lot of guts yeah i mean you could say it was either gutsy or crazy but i'll go with gutsy um <laughs> you know they say this i don't know who says it but there's this phrase about watching the masses and doing the opposite right 
and that's what I decided to do. I was watching the masses. I was watching what was happening. And in the UK, there's something like 5.5 million small businesses that exist. It's a lot of small businesses and a lot of solopreneurs and entrepreneurs that need help and need support. And during COVID, especially people that had been put on furlough and things like that, they um some people decided to start something they saw that opportunity a lot more people were at home being creative ha having the space to come up with ideas having the space to to think about that thing that they enjoy you know a lot of a lot of people went back to to their craft to their creativity whether it was baking whether it was drawing whether it was music you know people weren't People weren't flocking to go back to work and be in front of computers. I actually crave the opposite. And from that, a lot of people started business businesses. And I thought to myself, you know what? There's a lot of small businesses already out there and a lot more coming along that need help that don't understand brand, which is fine. You know, you don't know what you don't know, but I think it's important that that small businesses are supported, especially when they make up so much of the economy. And I decided that I was going to be the person to do that. Absolutely. And I, I see that you fell, you fell straight on your feet because, you know, with what you have created and now you also have a podcast that's reaching over 52 countries. And it's just a testimony of your ability to really connect at a global level all right first of all when you, you you did mention a lot of people you know during covid were out creating stuff some people were learning to bake and uh, the remnants of them are i don't know my watch watch my, my wife watches this lady who just starts things from scratch every time you know oh i was thinking of making chewing gum and all of a sudden she's got chewing gum for her <laughs> kids and i'm like uh, yeah that is very creative but that only happens when you've got that much time and everything else who's got that much time but first of all what prompted you to start your podcast from scratch and how has it influenced you know your work as a brand strategist so the podcast came purely from a love of talking <laughs> 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 i have to be honest with you prosper and you I have to be honest with the listeners um at school one of the things that always used to come up on my my reports everything was really really good but the thing that maybe needed improving was danielle tends to talk too much <laughs> <laughs> Danielle would get better results if she didn't talk and distract others. <laughs> so I've always loved talking to people and um I I love meeting new people and I love I love hearing people people's stories. And also one of the things that that often crops up when I have conversations with people when they find find out what I do, if you dig a little bit deeper you'll there's often something that that people have this idea, this thing that they have that they don't don't know how to start. A lot of people are in these nine to five jobs, but actually they dream of, I don't know, starting a football academy for girls, or opening a coffee shop that also is a library because they love books. Like everyone's got something, and the thing that I kept hearing was. Oh yeah, I've got this thing that I'd like to do, but I don't know where to start. So I figured for those that are in the very, very early stages of their journey, maybe they've got the idea of they've got, got a little bit of money, but they haven't got a big budget to invest in branding. If I start a podcast, interview lots of people that either had the idea themselves and grew it, but didn't understand brand and now they have a brand, or maybe they've got some understanding of branding and they've built a business. So by sharing these stories, by having these conversations, if it inspires one person to think, oh, okay, so that's what they did and that was their journey. And okay, if I take one thing and focus on it, that's gonna help them. And so that's that's why I started it. And it's been it's been a labor of love because I knew nothing about podcasting. 
I remember Googling microphones and going and doing this course, this course about podcasting and learning about audio and why you need to wear headphones and production and editing. And I was just like, whoa, okay. But I thought, right, I'll just, I'll just start. The sooner I start, I'll start imperfect. It was very imperfect, Prosper. <laughs> It was very imperfect. <laughs> I'll start imperfect. If you listen to my early episodes, you will notice the difference. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Wasn't it um, the creator of LinkedIn who says, if you're looking at your first product and you're not embarrassed, then you haven't innovated enough. Do you know what I mean? So, so many people would have started, um, if, even when I started my podcast, I think the podcast that I started was only about the first episode that I did was um, just me talking and I only managed to be there for four minutes. Um, <laughs> and most of the time it's just me just wondering, is, is this thing on? Is <laughs> it's tapping the mic. Like, yeah, yeah. You, you know, know <laughs> <laughs> but the thing about, um, you know, hosting a show is about, like you say, telling other people's stories, which basically helps them. First of all, in life, I believe we're here to leave, to learn and to contribute. And for you to live your best life, you need to learn. And the only way you can learn is either through other people's mistakes, stories, or you having to experience some of the things and some of the lessons, especially when it comes to business, are expensive. So you can't be able to do it all by yourself. So you'd have to listen to people that have gone through and see how they escaped, you know, whatever calamities or whatever it is. But you bring in the power of storytelling. I mean, obviously you were saying you're naturally inclined to be talking. And I think had we been sitting in the same class, then that would have been the two of us uh, always in trouble. Now, how are you helping businesses that are maybe not able or as strong enough in telling their story to actually craft their brand narrative, because the more you can talk, the more people get to know, like, and trust who you are. And storytelling is such a crucial aspect of brand identity. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the way, the way that I'm helping clients with that is really staying curious that's my first thing um i ask a lot of questions and some of those questions can be difficult and sometimes these questions are, are things that people have never ever thought about um you know questions like okay so this product that you have um why why do people buy it um if they don't buy it do you know why they're not buying it um, your competitor, maybe they've not even looked at their competitor. There's someone out there in the market selling the same thing that you're selling. Um, why should a customer come to you instead of them? Have you thought about why they do? Have you asked them? So I ask a lot, a lot of questions at the start to really understand, to get a view of the brand as it stands, as it exists today and paint a picture of it. And then off the back of that, it's all about trying to craft the brand DNA. <clears throat> so understanding from the inside out why the brand is there. So the why, <clears throat> excuse me, um, why the brand exists and what the core offering is, you know, the what. So the reason that they have produced this widget, this product or service um, and the who ultimately, who, who it's for. But I think the 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 way that I work with clients as well is to to get them to really understand their customer. I think a lot of brands can be very focused on the product or service, and I get it. It's their thing. It's often their business. If they're the founder or or I'm, I'm working with the founder or co co founder, this is their baby. Okay, this is something that they've they've created and nurtured and grown, and it means the world to them. But actually that doesn't really matter. And I think that's the thing that's quite important is helping clients to, to shift their mindset about how 
how the brand isn't for them it's for the client it's for the customer it's for their audience and the more attention you pay to your audience what their needs are what their hopes and desires are what their problems are helping to solve their pain points that's when you have a successful a successful brand and that's what i do with my clients i get them to really really understand their their customer i'm doing it with a client now and we're getting into extreme detail <laughs> about their ideal customer and i'm like no no we need we need to paint a picture of them we need to give this person a name like who are they where are they how old are they what gender are they and 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 they were hesitant they were like ah oh, but i want to i want to help lots and lots of different people and i was like i get it i completely understand it but by talking to everyone you're talking to no one and i want you to imagine if every single person that came along was this person with these values okay with this with this problem with these aspirations and this budget <laughs> would your business grow would you be happy okay great because everyone else is a bonus then, right? By focusing on this one person doesn't mean that you're not gonna attract other people that don't fit into this mold. But by being focused and by niching, you are gonna know who you're talking to. You can, you can position yourself in a way that speaks to that person. And that's, that's what brand building is about. Absolutely. It kind of feels like if somebody's scrolling through their newsfeed and then they read a post that comes from your client, they literally feel like, well, I'm the one that's being called out, you know, because so many people um being bombarded with a lot of noise. And if you're not, you know, appreciating your customer's journey or where they're at, it'll be very difficult for you to sort of single them out. But then that now requires the client or your client to be very authentic in the way that they show up in the space. And um, I think one aspect that really stands out about your work is the commitment to building brands that resonate with their customers on a deeper level um, by you painting that picture, really showcasing that this is who I'm working with and this is the person I'm, I need to call out. Now, how do you ensure that that now becomes consistent and the authenticity and sincerity is maintained? Because half of the time when you become too very focused on the client, it just really feels like you're now targeting them or in, for lack of a better word, like really singling them out. And some people kind of get triggered by m most things that, that seem to expose who they exactly are. So you're talking about brand consistency here, Prosper, how to, how we keep the brand consistent then. Yes. So that comes from constantly reviewing and auditing the brand. So when someone starts working with me, one of the key things is to establish what their goals are and have a look at how brand can help them do that. So for example, I had someone coming to me that that said that um, they were getting inquiries, but the people that were that were inquiring were always wanting a discount and weren't happy with the price point, feeling like they were charging too much because they looked at other competitors that were cheaper. They were like, oh, well, such and such is charging this. So why are you charging so much more? So the goal, one of the goals, when and this was a client that I worked with, one of the goals was around, okay, so how do you how do you charge a higher price point? How do you elevate your brand so that pricing doesn't come up? So so you you look and feel more premium. So that was the goal. So off the back of that, it was all about looking at the brand in terms of the messaging. So the words that are being used, words are so important and also how the brand looked and so how do you do that okay you look at you look at the market okay what other organizations what other brands are out there that are doing similar things to you 
and let's have an, an audit of them visually. How do they look? What fonts are they using? What colors are they using? What, what, um, what words are they using? And then seeing if we can find some pricing and then going, okay, so based on where they are, how do you look against them? Do you look cheaper, but actually you're charging more? Okay, so we need to change the way you look and the way you sound. We need to elevate you. And we did that. We elevated the brand. We changed the name actually. Um, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna call, call my client out actually, cause I'm, I don't think she'll mind. I think she'll be quite happy. So she went from being called Primaris Consulting, which no one knew how to say, to True Path Careers, because she writes CVs for clients that are looking to really take the next step in their career and be earning, you know, six figures plus. So it was all about elevating her brand so that she could charge this high price point. But now it's about making sure every month, every quarter. Okay, so let's review the clients that are coming in, the customers that are coming in. Are we still on par? Is your messaging still okay? Do we need to tweak anything? Are you still attracting the right kind of clientele? That audit, that that review you know branding's never done you have to keep an eye on it because mm. whenever you throw something out there a whole different person comes back in and you're like wait a minute we haven't seen this person what caught their attention and moves um you know see if if they're the right kind of person that you may have overlooked then create um you know strategies to get more of that sort of person all right and absolutely you offer a free branded uh, branding audit session am i correct so that yeah people... that's correct yes yes because you did mention you're looking at other people's brands and stuff like that so if somebody wants to start working with you um what would be what would be the one thing they need to do yeah so the one thing that they need to do is you can get the brand audit i'm on linkedin all the time um, so yeah, drop me a message on, on LinkedIn, say free brand audit, and I'll send you the link. Um, and I'll also share the link with you prosper. Um, there's also my website as well. They can come and find me at danielleclark.uk. And yeah, if, if someone needs some help and they want this free brand audit, they can absolutely put that in. Absolutely. I will put the links that you're going to share with me in the show notes below so that people can actually get started on their journey. Now, this has been a, a journey, really, that started off as you were young at eight years old, you know, creating these magazines. And now you're sought after, um, you know, brand strategist, uh, having worked with companies that are simply clever, you know, and you were part of that uh, sort of um, making. Looking back at your journey, if you could maybe be one of the parents or one of the older people that would have edged that eight-year-old Danielle on, you know, after having created the magazine or come up with the idea, what sort of advice would you you know, would you have given to that young girl knowing what you know now about life and what you turned out to be? What sort of advice would I have given to, to eight year old me? <laughs> I would have said to, to just keep, keep being you, keep being you and keep keep being creative, keep playing. Okay. Um, to, to not put so much pressure on yourself. <laughs> first and foremost, to, to stay young and creative and, and to just keep going, you know, keep playing, uh, and having fun. That's what, that's what I would have said to me. I, I yeah. Absolutely. Well, you seem to keep doing that. I mean, the hockey and everything else that comes along with it. And now you're working with brands that are changing other people's lives. You know, in the example that you've given, um, you know, that guy who's a, a fitness trainer and also the career coach who is helping people 
with um, life changing CVs. So it's things like that. Now that we know where you've been and what it is that you're working on, what's next? I mean, I know you're going to be at on stage next week, but what's what's <laughs> what's beyond that? Yeah. So yeah, aside from that, what's beyond that? To um, do do more public speaking because I absolutely love it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, whether that's on, on podcasts or, or in front of people. Um, and also to, to really uh, hone in on, on helping people that... I want to help people that want to improve the way we think, the way we feel, the way we move, the way, our, the way we live our lives. I think, I think life, is so, life is so rich and it's such it's such a gift and i think if there's people out there that are trying to improve people's lives so that they can live happier healthier lives i want to be the person to help them do it because it brings me so much genuine joy and fulfillment so yeah honing in on that really honing in on people that are in the whether it's coaching health wellness well-being anyone that's trying to improve someone else's life i'm i'm all for um i think i think life is richer if you can live it in a healthy and happy way absolutely i quite like that because you can't do well if you're not feeling well so if the whole world is operating at the maximum you know things can be created uh, life is experienced in a whole different way. And it's because of people like yourself that all these other coaches and consultants will be standing on in order for them to create businesses that are profitable. And they will also be able to reach out to their clients and, um, you know, ensure that they impart that information that helps people have a happier existence. So, in a nutshell, you are doing your part to make the world a better place. And, um, you know, it's it's just small things like that. Just like they say, if a butterfly, you know, flaps its feathers, it could actually end up as a tsunami or a tornado in another hemisphere just because of the ripple effect of the things that you're doing. So stay the course. <laughs> I will certainly try. I will certainly try and 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 hopefully, yeah, that ripple effect will be nothing but but positivity, creativity and collaboration as well. Absolutely. I quite like that. Well, thank you so much, Danielle, for your time on the Online Prosperity Show today. And uh, yeah, I can't wait to hear what else you're going to be coming up with in the future. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for, for having me on the show, Prosper. It's flown by. And yeah, I've loved talking to you today. So thank you. Absolutely. Well, it's your life story and your positive experiences that made this a very captivating journey through the world of branding. And uh, yeah, you were just, it's, it's your world. We were just the passengers in this ride. <laughs> Thanks for being passengers. <laughs> <laughs> Great stuff. And if you're still watching right now, um, I encourage you to check out Danielle's links in the show notes so that you can actually get started on your own branding journey. And don't forget to check out her free brand audit session so you can take your brand to new heights. And if you enjoyed today's episodes, just be sure to rewatch it and uh, subscribe for more insightful content that will actually fuel your path to prosperity. Until next time, stay inspired and keep reaching out for those stars. Bye for now.